war in the 21st century is devastating and explosive. No target is secure, even hundreds of miles away. Today's high-tech weapons are the culmination of a transformation that began nearly 500 years ago, during the age of Leonardo da Vinci, at the height of the Italian Renaissance. Today, Leonardo is most famous for the beauty and mystery of his paintings. But for most of his life, Leonardo was known equally well as a military engineer. Leonardo was fascinated with war as a physical activity. Not the killing of people, but the dynamics of war. The attackers, the defenders, all the physical properties of throwing things at each other, whether they be ancient uh, ideas like the trebuchet or the ballista or the catapult, or new ideas like uh, cannons. How the Renaissance's most famous artist became renowned as a creator of war machines reveals much about Leonardo the man, the inventor, and the world in which he lived. Leonardo was born out of wedlock in 1452 in the small rural town of Vinci, 22 miles outside of Florence, Italy. Here he developed a lifelong fascination with nature which he would draw with legendary skill. But his illegitimate birth denied Leonardo the right to a formal education and later excluded him from the most lucrative occupations in Florence. Throughout his career, Leonardo's success would depend on his wit and talent and the patronage of the era's richest, most powerful and often dangerous men. I think he was a man of ambition, and uh, he wanted to get ahead, to move out of his rural background and of his uh, illegitimate background, and to make a name for himself. And uh, it certainly started in Florence. He would try all sorts of means of learning, of promoting himself. Artist, architect, inventor. Leonardo pursued many vocations throughout his life. In 1482, at the age of 30, he took the biggest risk of his career, abandoning his hometown of Florence for a new city and new opportunities. One of the things that Leonardo did that shocked his contemporaries and still shocks some modern people even today is that he moved from Florence, the cultural capital of northern Italy, to Milan, which was clearly the political and military bad boy of all of the Italian city-states. He wanted a broader scope for his work. Milan was a place that lived and died by the sword. A reflection of its leader, Ludovico Sforza, known as Il Moro, the Dark One. He sold his services to Duke Ludovico as a military engineer, despite the fact that he had no training in that particular area. But he was brilliant, he knew what the client would like, and he certainly had a number of ideas that any militarily ambitious ruler would like. Whatever the era, Mobility is crucial to victory on the battlefield. To impress his new patron, Leonardo proposed mobile bridges, covered ladders, even assault boats, guaranteed, as he wrote, to cause great confusion in the enemy. He understood better than most of his contemporaries the psychological effect of weapons and realized that war is, at bottom, a kind of psychological exercise. It's much more efficient to terrify your enemy and to cause him to flee than to have to kill and kill and kill again in order to be victorious on the battlefield. And I think many of his weapons were designed, at least in part, with this in mind. Of all Leonardo's designs, none was more intimidating than his giant crossbow, a battlefield colossus sure to get the enemy's attention. And the details he provided are fascinating. The crossbow was to measure 42 braccia, or roughly 27 yards across, 
The bows were made of layers of thin wood to increase their flexibility and create greater firepower. Many have mistaken the dark lines on the central shaft for a large arrow. But the pouch at the end of the double bowstrings suggests the true projectile to be of heavy stone, or perhaps a flaming bomb. Those lines are, in fact, a worm screw mechanism used to arm the crossbow. A block along the mechanism is moved forward to engage the bowstrings. A soldier then cranks the bow backwards using the worm screw. Firing the weapon required the soldier to either slam the block down with a heavy mallet or lever the bowstrings upward with a crowbar. It's so persuasive that you think it would work, but if you look at it a little bit, you wonder whether it would work. But he makes his art, makes the impossible or the improbable into something that is possible. It's why his notebooks and so many of his experiments on paper are so interesting. Because what are they? Are they art and imagination? Or are they observation of how things should work? Are these things real? Or are they projections of what might be? In 15th century Europe, the use of gunpowder was in its infancy. Yet Leonardo's drawings anticipate a battlefield dominated by heavy and light artillery, armored vehicles, and multi-firing weapons. Technology that didn't emerge until the 19th and 20th centuries. And the solutions he foresaw were often startling examples of his mechanical ingenuity. The problem with firearms on the battlefield is that their reload times are much too long, and there's no way around this. You can't really speed up the reload cycle for these kinds of guns appreciably. So the only way they're really useful is in mass amounts. To Leonardo, the answer was to build multi-barreled guns, which were mobile and could allow the gunner to create a volley of fire before reloading. In his most spectacular design, Leonardo proposed 33 small caliber gun barrels, organized in three rows of 11 each. All three rows were mounted on a single revolving framework. Once the first row of ammunition had been fired, the gunner could easily set up the second and third rows to follow. Meanwhile, the expired rows could be either reloaded or allowed time to cool. Clearly, a precursor of the modern machine gun. But of all the weapons that Leonardo conceived, none would have altered battlefield combat more than his covered chariot, what we now call Leonardo's tank. In assaulting a fortified position that's heavily defended, the attacker is going to take a lot of casualties. This is very encouraging to the defender. A covered wagon, a sort of tank-like vehicle propelled from the inside and impervious to most of the weapons that most defenders would have, is going to get through and get up to the base of the wall, and that's going to be terrifying to the defenders. Like many of Leonardo's conceptions, the tank was inspired by an object in nature, in this case, a tortoise shell. Its exterior was reinforced with metal plates and slanted to deflect enemy fire. Small portholes in the tank's walls allowed men inside to return fire. A similar set of portholes in the upper turret gave the tank commander a full scope of the battlefield and allowed him to direct the tank's forward progress. Power for the tank was born on the backs of eight men who used a series of cranks to turn the wheels. Interestingly, Leonardo's design featured the cranks running counter to one another, making forward progress impossible. It's a novice's mistake, which someone of Leonardo's talent wouldn't have made. Some have suggested that Leonardo sabotaged his own design because he was a pacifist at heart and realized the tank's deadly potential. But there's another explanation. As an artisan, he didn't want any of his ideas stolen by others. You know, there were no copyright laws in those days, and um, he didn't want these ideas published. He wanted them for himself and uh, perhaps eventually for his patrons. This possibly intentional design flaw was only one technique that Leonardo may have used to ensure that his creations remained under his control. Although there are many theories about its origin, Leonardo's famous mirror writing was clearly another deterrent 
challenging the overly inquisitive to try to read his words and sentences backwards. The fact that they were mirror written in that almost illegible left-handed scrawl of his indicates that they were really designed for his use only. Such strategies must have worked because Leonardo's skills as a military engineer were always in demand. For 17 years, Il Moro, the Duke of Milan, was his most reliable patron. But later in life, Leonardo worked for clients including generals in Venice, the Pope in Rome, and the bloodthirsty Florentine, Cesare Borgia. Cesare Borgia was in many ways a psychopath. He was ruthless, violent, vicious, faithless, and had very little to actually commend him as, as anything except a successful military commander. For Borgia, Leonardo created detailed maps of the Italian countryside, crucial tools for the strong man's ambition to control all of central Italy. And Leonardo offered sophisticated ideas for new fortifications to counter the growing threat from mortar and cannon. Walls would be angled to deflect incoming artillery shells, while built-in cannon platforms were added at key junctures to allow return fire. For many of Leonardo's patrons, war became an art unto itself. And Leonardo had used his war machines as a calling card to gain their favor. But when he had a choice, Leonardo pursued many other interests, including what are now known as Leonardo's Lost Robots. In addition to devising his own recipe for gunpowder, Leonardo designed cannon shells that exploded on impact or divided into smaller explosives while still in flight. Da Vinci Tech will return on Modern Marvels. In January 2004, twin robots landed on Mars. The latest in NASA's long-term effort to explore the red planet using robotic devices. Self-propelled and controlled by computers, the Mars rovers represent the pinnacle of automation and the power of machines to extend the reach of man to wherever he might dream. But few people realize that 500 years ago, Leonardo da Vinci was already a pioneer of robotic devices. Used for entertaining and honoring his patrons, Leonardo's robots reveal the facility of his mechanical mind. They are the ultimate expression of talents that emerged while he was still a young man in Florence. He entered uh, the scene in a period and in a place which was blessed by God in a sense. Florence, uh, end of the 15th century, fantastic site to develop skills and talents. Florence in the 15th century was the heart and soul of the Renaissance, a place where the creative energies of art, science, and politics were fused in great public works that dominate the city even today. It was a city that was a work of art in itself, where the idea was to turn the bricks and mortar into a reflection of a certain set of principles and ideals. No project embodied those ideals more magnificently than Brunelleschi's dome one of the era's great engineering marvels. Its structure stands more than 300 feet and is still the largest masonry-built dome in the world. In 1471, when Leonardo was 19 years old, the city council of Florence commissioned the dome's final phase. To place a two-ton bronze orb on the dome's peak, the city elders turned to Andrea del Verrocchio, Leonardo's mentor and one of his greatest influences. To complete the task, Verrocchio employed a fleet of complex machines. Standing at his side, Leonardo marveled as giant hoists and cranes lifted the material skyward. During the final stage, the size and weight of the bronze orb required elaborate scaffolding and a crane that shifted the load and counterweight simultaneously to keep in perfect balance. When the project was completed a year later, Leonardo declared that mechanics truly was the paradise of all sciences. And in the years to come, Leonardo used the same pulleys, weights, and gears to create many inventions, including this early ventilation fan, and this hydraulic power saw,
of particular interest were clocks. The way one action led to and followed another suggested many possibilities, not just for telling time, but for many other applications as well. And later, when conjoined with springs, foreshadowed Leonardo's robots. Engineer and author Mark Rosheim has spent a lifetime solving the mysteries of Leonardo's robots. Beginning with this complex drawing, it had baffled scholars until late in the 20th century. This is way before anything else. I mean, this is the earliest we know of a device like this. So it changes history, you know, changes the technological timeline. What the drawing reveals is a small cart that's self-propelled, programmable, and capable of moving in a series of different directions on its own. The clock-like mechanics reveal much about Leonardo's genius. Well, starting in the 1920s, when this kind of got on the radar screen of historians, the thought was that these springs, these leaf springs, were what propelled the cart. And they would actually alter the, the drawing and have these things tied down to these corner cogs and, uh, and they'd come up with these crazy reconstructions instead of looking at what Leonardo had actually done. Rosheim's mentor, scholar Carlo Pedretti, was the first to suggest that the large toothed gearheads obscured something more. A pair of coil springs hidden beneath, the true source of the robot cart's power. The visible spring devices, once assumed to be the power source, were in fact the steering mechanism. My first discovery was that these pedals here were cams. They were faintly drawn, and then I could see that these cams tripped this lever. And then I could deduce that this lever must be connected to the steering wheel. The larger the cams, the sharper the turn of the steering wheel, and vice versa. The cams could be placed in any order, allowing the engineer, in essence, to program the route the robot cart would take. Even speed could be regulated. After that, the question was, what did these things do, these cogs? And I could see this other spring here. These were behaving like a clock. This was the tick-tock of a clock. In other words, this was behaving like the pendulum of a clock, and it was regulating the release of the energy in the spring. In this case, the springs are underneath these big gears. The clock-like release of energy within the springs guaranteed the robot cart a smooth, steady ride as it moved through a room on its own. A remarkable sight in the 15th century, sure to wow Leonardo's patrons, just as we are astonished by today's robotic devices. The big thing is it proves that the roots of technology go far deeper than we ever realized, that the concepts of programmability, concepts of computer uh, computerized robots go hundreds of years deeper than we ever thought. But Leonardo's cart was only the first of his robotic creations. While at the court of Milan, Leonardo was called on by the Duke to oversee the elaborate court pageants that played a vital role in his rule. The prince had to be surrounded by magnificence. He had to represent the wealth and culture and military prowess and uh, dignity and even almost the anthropological bloodline of his people. And pageantry did this in an extraordinarily successful way. It wasn't just entertainment. It was propaganda. In 1495, Leonardo unveiled a robot knight at one of the Duke's celebrations. The robot knight could sit, stand, and raise its visor, all by means of an elaborate pulley and cabling system. There's evidence that it was capable of independent motion. It could go like this. There's also evidence that it may have had uh, the ability to have a cable stretched across its two arms, and that it could, for example, grab somebody. In 2002, Rosheim built the knight robot proving that Leonardo truly was a master of robotics. The machines are so, they're Swiss watch-like. I mean, there's so very few components doing many different roles, and they're just so simple and so elegant. Nowhere would that elegance be more apparent than in Leonardo's attempts to conquer one of the greatest of man's challenges, flight. 
To construct the night robot, Mark Rosheim and his team employed more than 20 pulleys, a modern car jack, and 46 feet of steel cable. Da Vinci Tech will return on Modern Marvels. Flight. It's now so commonplace that many of us forget just what a threshold it once was. For Leonardo da Vinci, to fly was a dream that haunted him and inspired him to design a host of incredible flying machines. Today, many consider him the grandfather of modern aviation. So it was the first time that any kind of engineering discipline had been put into the design of an aircraft. Up to that point, it had been either mythology, like Icarus and Daedalus, or these poor guys who strap wings to themselves and jump off a tower or a wall. Leonardo da Vinci had thought about the materials. He thought about the sizing, the proportions. He observed nature and took from nature what had to be taken in his mind to make it work. Like the ancients before him, Leonardo's fascination with flight began with the observation of birds, which he studied for most of his life. In his mid-30s, Leonardo began making detailed drawings of birds, seeking to explain the dynamics of their wings. We know from his drawings and from his writings that he always started with concrete observations, direct observations, very precise, but it was not for the observation itself but in order to penetrate something deeper, to go behind flight to find out what the essence was. Over time, Leonardo began to see patterns in the dynamics of a bird's wings that resembled aspects of his other interests, especially mechanics. A bird is an instrument working according to mathematical law, he wrote, and those laws were within the capacity of man to reproduce with all its movements. To prove his theory, Leonardo began to experiment, not with air, but with water. Leonardo was very fond of analogies. Uh, he saw a similarity between water and air. What he really wanted to know was how birds fly. However, doing experiments on birds is difficult. So Leonardo thought, let me do experiments on water. And one of the things he did was to put a stick in the water and examine how the water flows around it. If I hold it in this direction, it makes hardly any difference. However, if I hold it perpendicularly, you see the water climb up behind. And this was important for Leonardo because he knew if he tilted the stick at an angle, he could perhaps get some lift from it. So it doesn't take much for Leonardo with his powerful imagination to go from a straight stick to an Archimedean screw, to an Archimedean spiral, and hence to imagine a helicopter. The aerial screw, better known as Leonardo's helicopter, is one of the most famous of his drawings. It offers his usual detail. The screw had a diameter of more than 15 feet, and it was made of reed, linen, and wire. Four men would stand on the central platform and turn the cranks in front of them, causing the shaft to rotate and create lift. Its weight alone ensured that his design couldn't have worked, but it did get Leonardo thinking. Soon he began experimenting with a wing concept that more closely resembled those of birds, and later bats. These inquiries culminated in the designs for Leonardo's ornithopter, a flying machine that flapped its wings just like a bird. There are many things about bird flight and bat flight that seem on the face of it to be an inspiration for full-scale flight. They do it so effortlessly. Leonardo's ornithopter is a true original, the first in history. Based on several drawings, the composite design featured a two-winged airship powered by human strength. The wingspan exceeded 33 feet, slightly less than a classic modern Piper Cub. The skeleton frame of each wing was to be made of pine, then covered in raw silk and starched taffeta to create a light but sturdy membrane. For power, the pilot would pump a set of back pedals using an alternate leg motion. A hand crank increased the energy produced, while a head harness operated both the rudder and elevator, allowing the now very busy pilot to steer. Leonardo realized that a bird's feathers weren't necessary for flight, but in order to generate the needed lift and thrust, the ornithopter's wings would need to twist as they flapped. If you just have a flat wing, one that isn't capable of twisting, you'll go nowhere. 
it would just stir up the air. For a wing design like Da Vinci's, you have to have twist, and I think he understood that, so that the wing would twist on the downstroke and twist the other way on the upstroke. Over time, Leonardo became so enthusiastic that he began to design additional elements to aid the pilot, including landing gear that featured shock absorbers. Such extras imply that Leonardo was serious about building the ornithopter. I think a lot of his devices and gadgets he didn't need to build. It was obvious to him from the drawing and from his wonderful imagination that they would work. However, he was very serious about building a flying machine, apparently built parts of it, but it must have struck him eventually that this thing just wouldn't work. Nearly 500 years later in 1991, Professor James Deloria and a team of his students launched the first remote-controlled, engine-powered ornithopter in history. Inspired by Leonardo's designs, the scale model proved that a larger manned ornithopter was indeed possible. Today, Deloria is even closer to fulfilling Leonardo's dream. Housed at the Toronto Aerospace Museum, this full-scale manned ornithopter features a 42-foot wingspan, proprietary wing elements, and a powerful engine-driven central yoke that flaps the wings at a rate of 1.2 cycles per second, driving the ornithopter forward at more than 50 miles per hour. But even if this design differs from Leonardo's original, the inspiration remains the same. What engineering is, it's a form of art. You're using the principles of science, the mathematics, but what you're getting is something brand new. So that, to me, is the pleasure of engineering. And Leonardo da Vinci, to me, is the highest manifestation, highest example of that combination of creativity and engineering and art. After years of trying to create the ornithopter, Leonardo put aside the pursuit of flight, only to return to it later with fresh eyes. Uh, you look at the birds, they say, birds are not so big. They stay without any movement in the air. They float. Leonardo realized that the key to flight wasn't to build a machine that overcame the forces of nature, but to build one that utilized those forces, to float and to glide. It's exploiting the force, not simply of man, but of the air itself, of air currents, of winds, and to obtain the force of man simply to correct that, like birds do. In June 2000, daredevil Adrian Nicholas transformed a sketch Leonardo had made in the margin of one of his notebooks into a soaring tribute to da Vinci's genius. Nicholas designed Leonardo's parachute to the master's exact specifications. Because it weighed over 200 pounds, 40 times more than a modern parachute, experts warned Nicholas that the design wouldn't work and that his life hung in the balance. But Leonardo's parachute did work. And Nicholas soared for more than five minutes. A grand gesture that proved again that Leonardo da Vinci should never be underestimated. Leonardo's time in Milan would soon come to an end, but not before he undertook the greatest engineering challenge of his career. In 1901, a 12-year-old Russian boy saw Leonardo's mechanical drawings, and they changed his life. Igor Sikorsky later built one of the first working helicopters in history. We all know the legend of the Spartan 300, but I want to know how these men really live. This is our version of Black Suit. Got a bunch of pig blood in there. We'll have a little taste. Warriors with Terry Schapper, tomorrow at 10 on History. So he's going away with Avis. Again, they'll probably get the where to GPS so he can find all his precious flavored coffees and driving ranges on his business trip. Fine. That's the way he wants it. Fine. Forget about him. You don't need him. Did he just look back? I think he looked back. Where to GPS can find anything from a driving range to a latte. 
from the time cities first arose, leaders have filled them with monuments and statues, public symbols that can unite not just individuals, but nations and even generations. In 1966, an American researcher working in Madrid made a startling discovery. Two lost Leonardo notebooks, not seen for generations. Inside were plans for a Renaissance-era colossus, a statue that would stand more than 24 feet tall, four times the height of an average man, and would require more than 80 tons of bronze to cast. It was known as Leonardo's horse, the most difficult artistic and engineering challenge of his career. This is complexity 360 degrees. You have anatomy, you have proportion, you have technical problem, you have infrastructural problem, you have economical problem because the amount of bronze was so much. Beginning in the early 1480s, Leonardo worked on the project for more than a decade, about three times longer than it took to paint the Last Supper. But for all his care and planning, Leonardo didn't live to see the horse completed. It became another of his lost dreams, until it too was reawakened nearly 500 years later by an American named Charles C. Dent. My uncle read this story about how Leonardo on his deathbed reportedly wept about not being able to finish the horse, decided, let's give uh, Leonardo his horse and uh, do this as a uh, tribute of thanks to the Italian people sort of like a, a Statue of Liberty uh, going in a reverse direction. Dent, a retired airline pilot and passionate art collector, decided to build Leonardo's horse by staying as true to the master's vision as possible. In time, others would join that quest, including sculptor Nina Akamu. The creation of a statue of this magnitude begins in clay in order to finalize the design. Leonardo's notebooks are filled with drawings of how horses move. At first, Leonardo wanted his statue to rear up, a revolutionary idea. But the engineering challenges were simply too great to overcome. Just the stresses on the legs would have been just too much. It would not have been able to be supported on its own, or also it could you know, tip and fall over. A, a, plethora of uh, difficulties with uh, 80 tons on just two supporting points. Eventually, Leonardo settled on a more traditional pose. Once finalized, Dent's team needed a full-scale clay model to begin the casting process. Great care was taken to ensure that this contemporary version mirrored Leonardo's own 24-foot-high clay model, which he unveiled to the Duke of Milan in 1493. Next, Leonardo would have had to solve the many challenges posed by controlling the 80 tons of molten bronze needed to cast the horse. One of the things that he was very concerned with, with this huge pour of bronze, was to be able to control the, the thickness of the, of the bronze. The thickness that they wanted to have was basically two fingers thick. Without the proper thickness, the statue would suffer from a fatal instability. So Leonardo devised an ingenious mold-making technique, drawing on the lessons of his earlier weapons designs. He adopted a number of techniques for making cannon, utilizing a technology for a variety of molds that uh, were really only used in, in military to bring it into art. And this was really quite fundamentally different from things that had been done you know, up to that point in time. The process begins with the creation of a master mold by coating the clay model in a hard, fast-drying material. Here, technicians use rubber, while in Leonardo's time, a unique plaster formula was used. Once the coating dries, the clay model is removed, leaving a hard plaster master mold. The inside of the mold is then covered with a uniform layer of wax, creating what Leonardo called thickness. Finally, a third layer, this time of fire clay, was applied. The master mold is now ready to be heated to more than 2200 degrees Fahrenheit, which causes the wax to melt and seep out the bottom of the mold. Molten bronze is then poured inside the existing gap, where it will harden and form the walls of the statue. 
Today, a sculpture the size of the horse is divided into sections, which are cast individually and welded together using modern joining techniques. For Leonardo, however, the challenge was to create the statue all at once in a single pour of bronze. Because of the size of the horse, no single furnace could deliver enough heat to ensure the liquid bronze would properly seep into every crevice. So Leonardo designed a complex series of pipes and ovens that would need to burn for more than a week to reach the requisite temperatures. Eventually, Leonardo resolved nearly every technical challenge for the completion of the horse and was preparing for its casting when history took a dark turn. In 1494, King Charles VIII of France invaded Italy. To forestall the capture of his city, Duke Sforza bribed the French with all 80 tons of Leonardo's bronze, which the French then turned into cannon. In 1499, the French returned. This time, the Duke fled, and Leonardo's 24-foot-high clay model was mocked by French soldiers. The clay model is reported by Ekronaka to be destroyed by the bows of the French soldiers arriving in Milan, taking it as a funny target against the Sforza regime after its collapse. In his notebooks, Leonardo records only a single painful sentence, I will speak of the horse no more. Almost 500 years later, in 1992, Charles Dent was receiving international attention for his work, and the horse's completion appeared within reach. But in 1994, Dent was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, and the end came quickly. Like Leonardo, Charlie never saw the horse completed in his lifetime, and uh, a group of us uh, promised him before he died that we would, we would finish the horse for him. Five years later, on September 10th, 1999, Leonardo's horse was finally unveiled in Milan, a moment that celebrated not only Leonardo and Charles Dent, but a creative legacy that binds two nations. But beyond the great statue, Leonardo's vision would lead us beneath the sea and even into space. Had it been completed, Leonardo's 80-ton bronze horse would have weighed as much as 50 Ferrari sports cars, or 13 of Michelangelo's Davids. Da Vinci Tech will return on Modern Marvels. In 1994, the last of Leonardo's notebooks, still held in private hands, was put up for sale. At ten million dollars, eleven million, twelve million, in the room at twelve million dollars, thirteen million on the telephone, fourteen million. The bidding at Christie's auction house began at five point six million dollars, but in less than four minutes, it rose to twenty-eight million. On the telephone in this room at twenty-eight million dollars. Last call, 28 million. Thank you. The buyer, Bill Gates, one of the world's richest men. Now known as the Codex Lester, the notebook attests to Leonardo's deep fascination with water, the essence of life, its rivers, indispensable thoroughfares in Renaissance Italy. We have to remember that in the Renaissance, uh, waterways were the main means of communication. Canals, rivers, this was the way in which you communicated. While in Milan, Leonardo spent many days at the Duke's estate in Vigevano, a small town just outside the main city. Here, amid many rivers and streams, Leonardo pursued his study of water. How it flowed, whirled, and eddied. These movements would reappear in his art, and they became the driving forces behind many of his larger inventions. 
In this design, water powered a large machine to grind and polish the surface of two mirrors simultaneously, speeding up a process traditionally done by hand. In 1499, with his horse in ruin and the Duke of Milan in exile, Leonardo left the city in search of new patronage. In 1500, he arrived in Venice and quickly assumed a familiar role, that of a military engineer. For the water city, Leonardo created a secret weapon, a leather diving suit for sneak attacks on enemy ships. Although not the first of its kind, it included the typical Leonardo details. Air was drawn through cane tubes attached to a small floating cork diving bell. A sealed leather bag with a valve could be inflated or deflated to surface or dive. But of all Leonardo's water projects, none was grander than his plan to redirect the Arno River, which ran through his native Florence to the port of Pisa and then into the Mediterranean. Leonardo had returned to Florence in 1501, where he befriended Niccolo Machiavelli, one of history's great political insiders and a man who dreamed big. Leonardo and Machiavelli had this great plan to build a waterway that would reach the Tyrrhenian Sea and that would bypass the city of Pisa, which was one of their great competitors. Without the Arno River, Pisa's commercial and strategic importance as a port would simply evaporate, and the city would become vulnerable to takeover by the Florentines. The initial plan was to channel the river southward, using weirs, dams, and a mile-long, 32-foot-deep ditch. By Leonardo's own estimates, construction of the ditch would require more than a million tons of earth to be moved, taking more than 54,000 man days. Heavy machines of his own design would supplement the workers. Construction actually started on the project, but heavy rain soon washed away the work. A year later, Leonardo tried to revive the project with a new set of plans, more elaborate than the first, including a much grander canal with mills. It was to be, in essence, a new industrial center under Florentine control. And he was making calculation in his, this would cost lots of money, he was saying to his patrons. But look, if you put there mills, if you make transportation by surface, and, and in five years you will recover. But again, Leonardo's grand project was abandoned. From then on, Leonardo's attention turned inward, toward his art. And to the search for the essence of human beings. Literally. Here in this recently discovered room hidden in a Florence monastery, Leonardo put down his brush and picked up the scalpel, conducting more than 30 autopsies. Refrigeration was not available, and tools were at times crude, resulting in an often gruesome process. But the detail of Leonardo's work reveals the depth of his curiosity, and that commitment continues to inspire. He's the father of kinesiology, the way human joints move, the father of uh, programmable computers, on and on and on and on. And, and when I went to design my uh, humanoid robot for NASA, I turned to his anatomical drawings because he drew them from the standpoint of an engineer. Today, we're experiencing a renaissance of interest in the master, and we're better able than ever to understand and assess his dreams and inventions. Yet our focus isn't simply on what was possible in Leonardo's time. It's also concentrated on the future. One day, Mark Rosheim's robotic devices might...
the sword, a reflection of its leader, Ludovico Sforza, known as Il Moro, the Dark One. He sold his services to Duke Ludovico as a military engineer, despite the fact that he had no training in that particular area. But he was brilliant, he knew what the client would like, and he certainly had a number of ideas that any militarily ambitious ruler would like. Whatever the era, mobility is crucial to victory on the battlefield. To impress his new patron, Leonardo proposed mobile bridges, covered ladders, even assault boats, guaranteed, as he wrote, to cause great confusion in the enemy. He understood better than most of his contemporaries the psychological effect of weapons and realized that war is, at bottom, a kind of psychological exercise. It's much more efficient to terrify your enemy and to cause him to flee than to have to kill and kill and kill again in order to be victorious on the battlefield. And I think many of his weapons were designed, at least in part, with this in mind. Of all Leonardo's designs, none was more intimidating than his giant crossbow, a battlefield colossus sure to get the enemy's attention. And the details he provided are fascinating. War in the 21st century is devastating and explosive. No target is secure, even hundreds of miles away. Today's high-tech weapons are the culmination of a transformation that began nearly 500 years ago, during the age of Leonardo da Vinci, at the height of the Italian Renaissance. Today, Leonardo is most famous for the beauty and mystery of his paintings. But for most of his life, Leonardo was known equally well as a military engineer. Leonardo was fascinated with war as a physical activity. Not the killing of people, but the dynamics of war. The attackers, the defenders, all the physical properties of throwing things at each other, whether they be ancient uh, ideas like the trebuchet or the ballista or the catapult, or new ideas like uh, cannons. How the Renaissance's most famous artist became renowned as a creator of war machines reveals much about Leonardo the man, the inventor, and the world in which he lived. Leonardo was born out of wedlock in 1452 in the small rural town of Vinci, 22 miles outside of Florence, Italy. Here he developed a lifelong fascination technology that didn't emerge until the 19th and 20th centuries. And the solutions he foresaw were often startling examples of his mechanical ingenuity. The problem with firearms on the battlefield is that their reload times are much too long, and there's no way around this. You can't really speed up the reload cycle for these kinds of guns appreciably. So the only way they're really useful is in mass amounts. To Leonardo, the answer was to build multi-barreled guns, which were mobile and could allow the gunner to create a volley of fire before reloading. In his most spectacular design, Leonardo proposed 33 small caliber gun barrels, organized in three rows of 11 each. All three rows were mounted on a single revolving framework. Once the first row of ammunition had been fired, the gunner could easily set up the second and third rows to follow. Meanwhile, the expired rows could be either reloaded or allowed time to cool. Clearly, a precursor of the modern machine gun. But of all the weapons that Leonardo conceived, none would have altered battlefield combat more than his covered chariot, what we now call Leonardo's tank. In assaulting a fortified position that's heavily defended, the attacker is going to take a lot of casualties. This is very encouraging to the defender. A covered wagon, a sort of tank-like vehicle propelled from the inside and in with nature, which he would draw with legendary skill. 
but his illegitimate birth denied Leonardo the right to a formal education and later excluded him from the most lucrative occupations in Florence. Throughout his career, Leonardo's success would depend on his wit and talent and the patronage of the era's richest, most powerful and often dangerous men. I think he was a man of ambition and uh, he wanted to get ahead to move out of his rural background and of his uh, illegitimate background and to make a name for himself. And uh, it certainly started in Florence. He would try all sorts of means of learning, of promoting himself. Artist, architect, inventor. Leonardo pursued many vocations throughout his life. In 1482, at the age of 30, he took the biggest risk of his career, abandoning his hometown of Florence for a new city and new opportunities. One of the things that Leonardo did that shocked his contemporaries and still shocks some modern people even today is that he moved from Florence, the cultural capital of northern Italy, to Milan, which was clearly the political and military bad boy of all of the Italian city-states. He wanted a broader scope for his work. Milan was a place that lived and died by the crossbow was to measure 42 braccia, or roughly 27 yards across. The bows were made of layers of thin wood to increase their flexibility and create greater firepower. Many have mistaken the dark lines on the central shaft for a large arrow. But the pouch at the end of the double bowstrings suggest the true projectile to be of heavy stone, or perhaps a flaming bomb. Those lines are, in fact, a worm screw mechanism used to arm the crossbow. A block along the mechanism is moved forward to engage the bowstrings. A soldier then cranks the bow backwards using the worm screw. Firing the weapon required the soldier to either slam the block down with a heavy mallet or lever the bowstrings upward with a crowbar. It's so persuasive that you think it would work, but if you look at it a little bit, you wonder whether it would work. But he makes his art, makes the impossible or the improbable into something that is possible. It's why his notebooks and so many of his experiments on paper are so interesting. Because what are they? Are they art and imagination? Or are they observation of how things should work? Are these things real? Or are they projections of what might be? In 15th century Europe, the use of gunpowder was in its infancy. Yet Leonardo's drawings anticipate a battlefield dominated by heavy and light artillery, armored vehicles, and multi-firing weapons. 